Greetings with lovers everywhere. I'm E-Train and welcome to E-Train Talks. And today I have a very special guest. This is Janae Marks, the author of A Soft Place to Land, on air with Zoe Washington, which is coming next week, February 14th, from the desk of Zoe Washington, her first book. And she's also took part in the Hope Wins anthology, which featured amazing authors like James Ponty, Stuart Gibbs, Adam Gidwitz, and a lot of others. So... Before we get started, here are just a couple of awards that Janae has won, just to put things into perspective of how amazing her books are and why you should buy them. So Janae, in the Connecticut Magazine, she is part of the 40 Under 40, which is really awesome. She was also part of Black Creators HQ and the outstanding Renegades of Middle Grade, with authors like Aaron Sodenberg Downing, James Ponty, and a lot of other middle grade favorites like Janae. So, Janae, thank you so, so much for joining me today. It is an honor, and I, I'm sure everybody is hoping to read On Air with Zoe Washington right when it comes out. They've already had their pre-orders in, and when people see this, they're immediately going to press the order button. Ah, well, thank you so much for inviting me to be on here. It's an honor for me, too, um, to be interviewed by you, because it's so cool to see all of the other authors you've interviewed in your podcast and all the posts you made and your YouTube channel and Instagram. I, you're doing so many cool things. So thank you for inviting me on. Thank you. And you're doing cool things as well, especially with all of your books. I devoured every single one of them, just like all the characters in Zo Zoe Washington devour her cakes and treats. <laughs> so my first question for you is, can you just tell us a bit about your days in, get this everybody, musical theater. Janae actually wanted to be in musical theater before wanting to become an author. So can you tell us a bit about that and what inspired you to become the writer you are today? Yeah. So when I was growing up, um, I think I might have been in the fourth or fifth grade when my parents took me to see my first Broadway musical. And I just fell in love with it, you know, just seeing musicals. Luckily, we lived in a suburb. I grew up in a suburb right outside of New York City. So every once in a while, you know, we could go into the city and go see a show. And I just loved it. Um, and I loved singing, um, too. So I would often, you know, see the show, get the soundtrack, bring the sound, you know, play the soundtrack. Back then it was all CDs and like blast them in my room and sing along. And I just loved that so much. And so in high school, I started to think more about like, oh, like if I really love musical theater this much, I should try to be more involved with it at school. So I, you know, I joined a few of the plays my freshman and sophomore year in school. Um, and I was part of the chorus and just kind of it just a lot of my favorite activities in general, just in high school, were performing arts. Like I did dance class. I took, um, you know, I took voice lessons at one point. I took some acting classes in like a local place at one point. Um, so I just really was into it. But then it kind of, there were two things that kind of maybe shift away from it. Number one, I actually um, auditioned to be in um, like college programs for theater. So like if you want to go to college and want to be in one of these programs for theater, often you have to audition ahead of time. And I auditioned for like four different school theater programs and didn't get into a single one of them. So that was kind of like the first moment where I was like, okay. And also it wasn't so much the rejection. I think it was more the experience of auditioning made me realize like, I don't even know if I like this enough, like to want to go through that again. Um, so I ended up going to college and doing some theater on the side when I was in college. So I still got to do it and it was fun. But I think I kind of realized like, you know what, I think the part of musicals that I like the most honestly is the storytelling and like just getting lost in the story and my mom even told me like you're always into writing like maybe you should go into writing plays and I wasn't necessarily interested in writing plays but I kind of realized how much I enjoyed writing stories in general I always liked writing as a kid for fun but I never really again I never really thought about becoming an author but when I was in college I became an English major and took some creative writing classes and I kind of realized like the things that I love about theater you know, was the stories and I can tell my own stories. So yeah, it kind of was just sort of like a natural shift once I sort of realized maybe performing wasn't what I love the most about it. Um, though I still love theater to this day, um, you know, as a, as a viewer. <laughs> well, I'm sure we are all so, we're all grateful that you kind of went from musical theater into writing because now we have all your three and I guess you could say one twelfth. Yeah. In Hope Wins. <laughs> to show for it. 
Yeah. Uh, do you still blast music like from the 90s, 2000s or whenever, whatever your jam is and sing it in the shower or something? Oh, totally. Yeah. I, um, if anybody has read from the desk of Zoe Washington, they'll know that there's a lot of songs in there. And mm -hmm. it was really fun to pick out some of those songs because some of those were the songs that I listened to when I was a kid or, you know, a teen. Um, so yeah, I still, and even Broadway, you know, with songs, I still will see plays, you know, now and, and get the soundtrack, you know, on my phone and I'll play them, you know, when I'm doing things. So I still very much appreciate music. Um, you know, yeah, it's definitely still a big part of my life. Well, I love musical theater too. And everything about music, it brings people together a lot like books. So that's kind of, there are a lot of connections between music and stories. And sometimes mm -hmm. there are music stories. And yeah, exactly. I feel like so many of these works, you know, whether it's music, books, theater, are about telling some sort of story through a medium. So I think they all kind of connect. Yeah. And my next question is one that I'm very, very excited to ask. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, from the On the Air with Zoe Washington, the sequel to From the Desk with, with of Zoe Washington, it is coming this Tuesday. From the time of yeah. recording, it's coming February 14th, and I am so excited. I have my own copy right now, but I, I would want to order it again and again just <laughs> to read it for the first time once more. And can you tell us a bit about on air with Zoe Washington, but without spoiling anything. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it is kind of hard to talk about it because it definitely spoils the first book. But essentially, if you read the first book, which tells the story of, you know, Zoe and um, kind of redeveloping a relationship with her father who's been incarcerated her whole life. Um, and then in that story, she ends up finding out that he might be innocent of his crime. And so she ends up trying to uncover the truth. So by the end of the book, you kind of, you know, there's an epilogue. Um, and, you know, if you kind of got to the end and you're like, oh, I wonder what happens next. Um, I kind of, you know, this is the next book really goes into what happens next after that epilogue in the first book. Um, so certain things that are you, if you liked the first book that'll be in the second book again are tons of baking again. Um, there's a lot of family themes, especially, you know, again, more relationships with um, Zoe and her parents um, and still friendship themes as well. So, um, yeah, like I think that if you like the first book, um, you should hopefully really like the second one as well because it continues the story and a lot of the same themes. And speaking of friendship themes, I don't think this is a spoiler, but her... Zoe's two best friends kind of become a thing if you're interested. In yeah, there's like crush. Um, yeah. yeah, there's, you know, she ends up being kind of put in the middle of her two friends liking each other and admitting to her that they like each other. And that becomes a whole thing because, you know, she feels a little bit left out. So that's definitely a, a, a new, um, you know, challenge she has to deal with in this story. Yeah, that's kind of what happens when you grow older or in, and you're in your teen years. I don't have experience because I'm not a teen yet. And I'm honestly really scared for that. I time. know. I know, and that's the thing. Yeah, it's like with this age group, writing for this age group, you know, not everybody is interested in that yet. And I think even in the story, I kind of go into how Zoe herself is not really interested in that yet, but it happens. It starts to happen. And I remember being in middle school and, and it's starting to happen to me too. Like some of my friends are starting to be interested in that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and that's kind of what middle grade is for, to teach you about like, like, don't be scared about this kind of stuff. It's going to be happening. Of, of course, you can be really scared, like, yeah, but it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's going to happen and it's all kind of part of the process. And mm -hmm. speaking of processes and all that kind of stuff, and from the desk of Zoe Washington and the sequel, On Air with Zoe Washington, baking is one of the central themes. And process, baking is really a process. I've only baked a few things, uh, like with my mom, but the process is just sometimes grueling, sometimes but it's always really fun. Mm -hmm. So... Being so baking brings Zoe and her father Marcus closer together, and that makes Zoe so happy, and also Marcus as well. So, why did you choose baking as a way to bring Zoe and Marcus close together? And are you a fan of baking yourself? Yeah, so I decided to add baking to the story because when I was coming up with some of the other, you know, plot lines in the first book, you know, I realized that some of them are kind of heavier, you know, like her engaging with this idea of whether or not, you know, Marcus has been wrongfully convicted, just thinking about, you know, the prison system and that sort of thing. Um, so I decided to add something lighter. And so I was like, well, what is it that I like, um, even if I'm not an expert in it? Because I am, I am, I do enjoy baking, but I'm not an expert baker. I don't bake all the time. I bake every once in a while. Um, but it is something I enjoy sometimes, but I'm not at any we're close to Zoe's level, but what I do really enjoy is watching all of those baking competition yeah. shows that are everywhere now. So like the, the Food Network's Kid Bake Championship is the one that kind of really inspired um, the show that Zoe wants to be on in the first book and sort of her 
personality around baking because I watched that show and there's all these kids and they're really good at baking and they're really passionate about it. Um, And I just was so inspired by that and thought it'd be really fun to make her kind of one of those kids. Um, So yeah, I think I was able to get a lot of knowledge about baking just from watching all these different shows because, you know, at the end of the episode, they have the judges, you know, judging these creations and they'll tell you like what works, what doesn't work. So you kind of start to, you know, notice some trends. (laughs) So that kind of helped me a lot in writing about the baking. But yeah, that was, and I, you know, I figured like food is a thing that kind of brings people together. So I felt like it could be a way for her to connect to um, Marcus is through food. Yeah. And I saw that you brought up Nailed It and from the, and on air yeah. in Washington. And that's one of my favorite shows and baking shows, especially. So. Yeah. I feel oh, like if I were to, connection. yeah, if I could compete on a baking show, that's probably the only one that I could maybe do well and <laughs> nailed it because yeah. like the expectations are pretty low, but yeah, no, I enjoy it. That's just super fun. Yeah. I think there's just so many of those baking shows out there that I think um, if you like those kind of shows, you'll hopefully like the Zoe baking scenes. Yeah. I certainly like them. And my next question for you is, Mar- so this is also just to kind of put things into perspective for everybody who hasn't yet read either on air with Zoe Washington or from the desk of Zoe Washington. So Marcus, Zoe's paternal father, was wrongfully accused of a crime and was in prison for nearly Zoe's entire life. He couldn't afford a good lawyer, and if it wasn't for Zoe's bravery, Marcus would never have been free for a while. So the topic of falsely imprisonment is not a topic I've really read about in middle grade before. So can you share why you chose this to be a main storyline and what message you'd like your readers to take away from Marcus's tale? Yeah, so I was actually inspired to write this book after listening to a podcast. So it's appropriate that I'm also on a podcast now talking about it. Um, back in 2014, there was this podcast called Serial, which is spelled S-E-R-I-A-L. Oh. And it told the story of basically the first season told the story of a man who was in prison for a serious crime, but a lot of people think that he didn't actually commit this crime. And so the podcast was kind of going behind the scenes uh, through the case and showing us, you know, going back to certain scenes, you know, in the environment, you know, like in the town that it took place in and talking to different people and everything. And um, it really just got me thinking about this idea of wrongful conviction. So I started just researching it out of curiosity, you know, thinking like, I don't know, maybe I could put this in a book. Um, So, yeah, I learned about the Innocence Project, which is an organization that's mentioned in the book, but also exists in real life. And they help overturn cases like this. They have lawyers um, who help work with inmates who have been wrongfully imprisoned and help get their cases overturned. Um, And they also have people who work to try to just change the system, you know, and change the laws and try to you know, um, try to make things better. And so from reading again through their website, it just got me inspired. And because, you know, at this point, I I, I knew I still liked writing for kids, young readers, I automatically started thinking about it from that point of view and was like, well, what if there was a story about a girl or a kid who had a parent who was possibly wrongfully in prison? And so that's kind of where it got started. It was just sort of my curiosity um, because I don't have personal experience with this, but, um, you know, I was able to do a lot of research and talk to different people, um, you know, to try to write the story authentically. Um, But yeah, and as for what I hope they take away, I mean, I hope that readers are inspired by Zoe's um, story and Marcus's story just in, in, you know, maybe they'll be inspired to learn more about the Innocence Project, you know, and go on there and and search around themselves or watch a documentary about this issue, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe the more kids like you that get to learn about this at a younger age, the more awareness there is around this problem, maybe things could change. Maybe in the future, we could, you know, this wouldn't be, won't be as big of an issue. I've heard, I've even had some readers say like, this made me want to become a lawyer when I grew up, you know, so it's like, maybe, to, you know, the youth of today will hear about these kind of things and want to actually do something when they're old enough to, I mean, you could do something now. Like Zoe obviously was able to use her voice now, but in terms of like changing the system, that's a little bit tougher um, to do, but at least a raising awareness will help hopefully lead to change in the long term. Definitely. And I love that you brought up that kids can do a lot because that's kind of a main topic here. Kids can really do anything and we don't get enough credit for all the powerful things that we can do and that we actually do and also I want to shift gears a little bit to a soft place to land which actually recently came out in paperback Mm -hmm. so it was your second book and Mm -hmm. it all it kind of tackles the topic of separation between parents and hopes hopes parents are kind of going through this and I mean that's kind of one of the topics a soft place to land was a wild and livable and awesome ride that I could not put down. So can you just tell us a bit about why you chose to have not necessarily divorce, but kind of as a theme and also 
the secret little area where all the kids in the apartment got together. Is that from experience too? Yeah. So the Soft Place Land was actually kind of inspired by a personal experience, unlike Zoe Washington. So um, when I was a teenager, my parents got separated and I moved um, and they ended up deciding to sell the house that I'd grown up in um, my whole life. And so, and then my mom and I moved into an apartment across town. And so in a soft place to land, Joy goes through a very similar experience, like, except in this, in her case, her parents aren't separated at that point. They're still together and they, due to financial troubles, have to move. And she's going through a tough time. And I also went through a tough time adjusting, you know, like I missed the old house I had lived in. You know, she misses her old house. And on top of that, in, in her case, she can they can no longer afford her piano lessons, which she was really excited about. Um, in my case, it was different. So there's like some similarities, some ways that I kind of took it into a fictional place. Um, and the other storyline of her, you know, through a friend in the building discovering the secret hideout, um, that part was totally made up. Unfortunately, the building I moved to did not have a secret hideout. Um, but that was, you know, it was kind of like sometimes when you write about your own experiences, you got to find ways to make it more interesting than what happens in mm -hmm. real life. Um, so that was one way of kind of like, like, where can I take this story next and make it into a more interesting story? But yeah, so that was, um, you know, having her discover the hideout and and, and involving the mystery was, um, it was really, it came through conversations I was having with my editor about the story and how I can kind of make it even better. And so we had this idea of like, maybe I can add something interesting, like a place in the building they go to or something. So yeah, it kind of just happened. Um through just brainstorming ideas for the story. But yeah, it, the original inspiration was was more personal for me. That's really interesting. And I also think that adding the secret hideout, because kind of like what happened with Zoe Washington, it's a bit of a heavy subject for yeah. middle graders and young readers. So adding that kind of secret hideout and the storyline behind that, how, well, everything that goes on there what you like to read is self place to learn to find out what happens. Yeah, I think like, anything. yeah, I think just the themes of community, you know, within this building and then within this like secret hideout space and like um, kind of feeling more at home, like a, a lot of what she's struggling with is feeling at home. And so I think, yeah, like I think locations and places in the story kind of tie into the themes. And yeah, it was it was fun to to play around. And I mean, who wouldn't want to have a secret hideout yeah. in their building? Like, it was just cool. It was just fun to write because it sounds so fun. I wish it existed in real life. <laughs> yeah, that did exist. I would want to go to that apartment right away. Yeah, like, like it sounds so fun. So it does. And my next question is about Hope Wins. So I'm just curious to know how you got involved in the anthology. Did someone, did um the editor in chief kind of ask you or was it kind of through your author friends yeah it was actually the first one so the editor rose brock she's an educator who also um runs uh in texas the north texas teen book festival and so that's like this organization that she runs there and i had been to the festival once and i don't i, I must have met her there or through other channels but somehow randomly i just got an email like from her asking if i would be involved in this anthology so this is actually they had another anthology um for young adult readers um, that she'd done a few years earlier. Um, and then she said, oh, you know, we decided we want to do one for the middle grade readers. And so, yeah, she asked me if I wanted to be part of it. And it was kind of an immediate yes, because I saw the roster of all the other authors that were going to be on it. And I was like, this sounds amazing. Like, you know, um, so yeah, it, it, it basically explained what the purpose of it would be, that we would all write sort of more nonfiction personal stories from our either childhoods or lives that feel hopeful. Um, and this was around the pandemic that she reached out to us. I think we were all, you know, the early days of the pandemic. So I think we were all feeling like, oh, we all need to like be thinking about more hopeful stories right around now. So yeah, that was kind of how I got invited. And then um, when coming up with the story idea, I kind of realized that writing about my long and winding journey to be published um, could be a good story because a lot of kids always ask, you know, how did you get started with writing? How long did it take? Um, and, you know, it was a really long, it, it was a yeah. long journey that really did involve me having to have moments of hope in order to feel like it was going to work out. So um, hopefully kids who have any kind of dream, whether it's to be a writer or anything else, like feel inspired by reading my essay in there um, yeah. about how perseverance eventually did pay off. <laughs> I love that. Perseverance does pay off. And hopefully you'll all check out Hope Wins because yeah. it's such a, well, hopeful and also just amazing read with some of your favorite authors. I'm not going to read the entire list, but there are some really big ones like R.L. Stein. Yeah, I mean, I was yeah. similarly like, <laughs> yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, yeah. having like Christina Sintornvat, Janae mm -hmm. Marks, of course. <laughs> And a lot of great ones. And my next question for you is, um, in preparing for our talk, I also read that 
while thousands of people have been wrongfully convicted and imprisoned across the United States. And one site even said that there are more innocent people in our jails and prisons today than ever before, which makes a lot of sense and also doesn't at the same time. There's a lot right. of, I guess, it's kind of a heavy subject, so I'm not going to dive too deep into it. But you would think that after all that's happened in this country, that there would be less wrongfully convicted people, that the system would be a lot stronger and smarter and kinder, I guess you could say. So I'm just curious to know if there's anything that kids or adults alike can do to try and put an end to this. And who is the most likely kind of whether race or anybody to be wrong, falsely accused? Yeah. So in terms of what you can do, I mean, it's hard to know. It feels like such like a broken system that it feels like kind of daunting to try to figure out how to fix it. But I do think that the more awareness there is around it, you know, the more that people know about this um, and can, you know, um, speak up about it, like just I feel like in general, like when it comes to any issue, the more awareness there is around it, the more likelihood that things could change in the future. I mean, a lot of these kinds of things happen, you know, like not to make this about politics, but, you know, when it comes to those kinds of things, you know, a lot of it can happen in your communities. You know, if you if you feel strongly that like, you know, somebody in your community could vouch for the kind of things that you want, you can vote for them, you know, so that like at the very least, you know, kids who are listening to this who are going to eventually be old enough to vote, that's something you can do because you can think about what are the policies that this person do I care about that this person might be able to help make change? I can vote for them. Um, you know, and but I think just raising awareness, even Zoe in the second book, which this isn't too much of a spoiler because you see it on the cover. She has a microphone just like you. Um, she decides to make a podcast, you know, to share some of her thoughts and, and raise awareness around some of the issues that, you know, um, wrongfully convicted people face. And I just think that the more people know about it, the more likelihood that there could be change in the future, whether it's, you know, in a political way or, um, you know, you know, even just the people who made that podcast, they were able, the one that I said inspired the first Zoe book serial, they were able to make a difference because they told his story and brought so much attention to this, to this situation that now he actually has been exonerated um, oh, wow. since then, um, years later, it took many years, but you know, it, it's like, and kids can do that too. It's you could, you can start be the one to say, Hey, something's wrong here. I want to talk about this. And you, maybe you don't have the power to go into the courtroom and make the change in that level, but you can, you can share and, and have these conversations. And the more people know about it, then hopefully the more people will want to do something to fix it. And they'll find its way to the bigger people who have more power. Um, So yeah, I just think that like raising awareness, honestly, is I think, and just, you know, informing yourself about these things can be, can be a way to help. Um, And then who is likely to be falsely accused from my research in the Innocence Project website? And there's also some other um, organizations who have like kind of run the data around this. Um, I found that, you know, black people are far more likely, innocent black people are far more likely to be wrongfully convicted than innocent white people. Um, There definitely is a racial element there, um, which is partially why I decided to, you know, tell the story and and make Marcus a black man. Um, When you look through the Innocence Project, even just the cases that they've helped, you can just see the photos, you could just look through the photos and see that the majority of them are are men of color even. Um, So, you know, which to be honest, isn't super surprising given like, you know, the world we live in, but, um, you know, is disheartening, obviously. So again, I think the more awareness that is raised around this, um, maybe change can be made. Again, I, I hope that like the prison system and the court system can be more like less, less biased and more fair and more kind, like you were saying. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a matter of like today's youth growing up and becoming the judges and the lawyers, yeah. you know, and filling those spots when you're older, you know, like, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's like we all can do a part, I think, though, in helping and helping make a difference just by being aware of it and, and making small little ch- changes in your life that could lead to bigger change for everybody. I don't want to sound adulty here, but kids, we have the power. Let's go out and make a difference. Yeah, like if you believe in this so, so strongly, you can go like those kids that have write, written to me and said, this made me want to be a lawyer. If they went to go be a lawyer, they could really make a difference one day, a bigger difference. I mean, now they can make a difference just by sharing, you know, and being more aware and maybe talking to friends and family about these issues but and when they're old enough to actually be in the courtroom they could really make a huge difference if they become a judge you know they can make a huge difference so it's you know yeah they really can we all really can yeah my next question is well for for starters your writing is just so moving and it's really relatable and i well just I, i love your books they are some of my absolute favorites and i'm curious to know 
do you have any other stories coming out? Is there a Zoe Washington book three, a Small <laughs> Place to Land book th- book two, or any standalone stories that may become series that you're writing? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for saying that. I'm so happy that you've enjoyed my books. Um, Yeah, I am working on more things. I um, have another middle grade novel coming out next year. It's not going to be, it'll be another standalone. Um, But this one it hasn't been announced yet. So I can't really share a title, but I can say that it's a little bit of a departure from my previous books because the previous books are always been straight, realistic fiction, contemporary. And this one is going to be realistic, but with a little bit of magic in it. So it's going to be a little bit of a departure, kind of like magical realism, I guess, where it still takes place in our world, but there's like magic kind of exists and there's going to be some of that in there. And I'm excited because it's been kind of fun to write something different, um, but kind of the same. I feel like still like Phil has, I still feel like it has a lot of similar themes that carry through a lot of my books, especially friendship themes um, and family themes and passionate kids, you know. Um, but yeah, there's gonna be a little bit of magic. So I'm excited about that. Um, yeah. And I I don't know if there'll be, I don't think there's going to be any more Zoe Washington books only because um, I really do feel like I said this about the first book and I wasn't even planning to write a sequel. I really do feel like it's wrapped up now and that there's not really much else that needs to be said. Um, but never say never, because I never <laughs> expected to even write the sequel. Um and as for Soft Place to Land, I mean, I would love to revisit some of those characters, especially because there's this like whole horde of characters in the book that I could even write a book from their point of view. It kind of all depends on my publisher's interest in that. So yeah, if, if, if the book, you know, continues to sell well and people like it, maybe maybe I could come back to that story from maybe a different character's point of view. That could be cool. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> that would be very cool. And I mean, I would love to see a Zoe Washington sequel. Besides, like, but though it might kind of become a YA as Zoe. I know, and that's the other thing, too. She has to get, she's older in the second book due to, like, the nature of the ending. Yeah. I, I Not to spoil it, but essentially she has to grow up in this book. Um, And so she's 14, and she's just about to enter high school. And that was what my editor was saying, too. I was like, can I even write a book about a 14-year-old? And she was like, well, as long as she's not in high school yet, it's still middle grade. So, yeah, it would be hard. I think at this point it would have to be YA. And I, there are very few book series that travel with the character through different categories like that. I would say maybe Harry Potter is the only one I can really think of. I don't know. So um, I don't really think that it's, that's going to happen. But yeah, you never say never, but no, I'm, I'm honestly like really pleased with the way these two books um, have come together. And I'm really glad it honestly was because of readers like you that I even thought to write a sequel because I would go to school visits and they would ask me. And at first I was like, no, I don't think I'm going to write a sequel. I feel like it's done. But then the more they asked, the more I really started thinking about it. So I definitely dedicate the book to readers because it really is because of them that I was able to do it. Um, So yeah, I mean, I'm just really happy that I was able to do the sequel. Um, And if that's the end for Zoe in the the book form, then that's fine. Um, I know one of your other questions you sent me was about the movie. Um, So there's a chance, too, of seeing her come to life in the screen. So that'll be another life for her as well. Um, Yeah, we'll see. And and your magic story kind of sounds like an Amari and the Night Brothers kind of vibe. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, there are a lot of other, I feel like there's a lot of, readers out there that enjoy you know there's so many other books out there too that do this and and readers enjoy it so it'll be fun to maybe um you know maybe gain some new readers that may only like to read books that have magic in it maybe they don't read regular straight contemporary so it'll be fun to maybe connect with some new readers too yeah it would be a lot of fun and you brought up the movie so yeah i am so excited because in the works at the moment is a zoe washington movie i was so (laughs) so excited when i stumbled upon it And I know that sometimes movies are kind of, sometimes stall out. I really hope this one doesn't. So can you tell us a little bit about maybe, like, if there are any differences between the book and the movie, maybe who the main character who plays Zoe is and a little bit and anything? Yeah, I wish I had all those details yet. So it is true that sometimes movie studios or producers or whatever will license the right for a book to make it into a movie and then it doesn't actually happen. Um, So I was aware of that when they signed it up. Um, But because of the way they talked about it and the fact that they ended up bringing in another producer like months after they first. So I, I first signed this deal with Disney channel oh, really? and they make Disney channel original movies. Um, And then months later they decided to bring on Carrie Washington as producer. So now it's also going to be partly with her production studio, which is pretty cool and exciting. Um, So because they announced her, you know, they brought her in, they didn't have to do that. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, and then they kept like, you know, they kept including it on some recent press releases that they've had around Disney Channel in general. Like they just on the bottom, they'll say like, oh, so-and-so is working on this movie. So I, it's one of those things where like it's the the um, 
Updates are kind of few and far between at the moment because I think that they're kind of dealing with a lot of other projects that probably got delayed due to COVID. So the last I heard, they're working on a screenplay. So Ooh. I hope that, you know, it will, it will, we will get to see it and, you know, actually see it become a movie. But because it's really only in the screenplay um, part now, like we don't have, like the casting hasn't been decided yet. Like um, any of that stuff hasn't been decided yet. I don't even have a date yet. So I'm hoping that like just this year, I'll just get more updates and I'll be able to share more updates with you about it. But hopefully sooner rather than later, they'll actually start. What from what I've heard, a lot of times once it gets to the production stage, then things move quickly. It's just a matter of like before that part, they might be juggling so many things that they don't get the chance to actually start making the movie yet. But yeah, I will see um with the screenplay, like what differences there'll be. But from talking to them, it sounded like they really did want to keep it as close to the story as possible, at least like, you know, the heart of the story. You know, yeah. they might have to make some changes just because actually showing certain things on camera might be harder than it was for me to write them but um yeah I think the heart of the story will stay the same from what I from what I gather and I'm very excited just as excited as everybody else to find out more you know yeah and everybody let's knock on wood cross our fingers and toes and let's keep on waiting and hoping for updates because we all want to see Washington come to life on the screen and with Disney Channel and Kerry Washington like when my dad heard that Kerry Washington was going to be producing this he was like, oh, I, she's awesome in a lot of the movies that I like. So. Yeah, she's great. And Disney Channel, I mean, they have they have the um, the power to make it. You know, they yeah. make movies all the time. So I think it, it feels much more of a sure deal than if it was with anybody else. But we'll see. Hopefully, I'll have news soon. Yeah. And I don't know if you can share it on Twitter or Instagram or your um, social medias, but we'll keep on waiting and waiting because... Yeah, here it is like... As soon as I'm allowed to share, I will absolutely share an update. Yeah. And maybe not that patiently because we all want to see it, but patiently and not patiently, I guess you could say. I know. Yeah. I'm in the exact same boat because, you know, like I, I, one thing that people might not realize, too, is how oftentimes how little participation authors have, you know, in in the movies that get made on their books. Um, It kind of depends Um, if you get take if you get brought on as like an executive producer, then you might have a lot of say. But if you aren't, then, you know things might not work out. Like, I, I think a good example is Rick Riordan has famously yeah. said he hates the original movies that were made out of his book. <laughs> and now they're doing a new series and he's yeah. much more involved in the series now. So he's kind of able to start over and, and make it right. But he was not happy with the movies from what I understand. Um, so that happens sometimes. And it's because the authors don't always get a say. And so I think I will get a little bit of a say. Like they told me I could consult a little bit, but I haven't, it just hasn't gotten to that point yet. So we'll see. Um, but hopefully yeah. we're all happy with it. Yeah, I think we all will be. And I don't want to talk bad about the first Percy Jackson movies, but well, that's that's, that's a topic. Well, for just to day. say it, just say that the author wasn't happy. That's yeah, the volume, you know, happy. like I'm sure he was so excited to have them make a movie. And if he wasn't happy with it, that's that's unfortunate. You know, there may not be bad movies, but he obviously felt like something was missing or they didn't really capture the heart of the books. And so I'm glad that he gets the chance to do it again. And, you know, hopefully that won't be the case for me. But, you know. Well, yeah. I love the Percy Jackson books and your books, so seeing them all come to life and with Disney. Yeah, it is exciting as a reader to see the movie. I I mean, I've watched lots of other adaptations, and it's so fun to get to see the characters come to life on screen. Probably so. one of my favorites is Wonder, and I kind of really captured Oh, that. yeah. Or even the recent Matilda. Like, oh, yeah. One. Um, that was a book, you know, like those that, I mean, even the first original movie was great. And now the musical is great too. So yeah, there's lots of examples of really good adaptations out there. So I'm hoping mine will be one of those. <laughs> I really hope so. And I, when it, when it does start producing, I know so, because the Zoe Washington story, as long as you capture the essence of it. Exactly. It really like if they have to change a few plot points or, you know, things like that, it's fine. As long as I think the, the story as a whole feels true. Yeah. <laughs> and my next question is, so I actually, I was kind of shocked when I saw this. So a lot of authors, a lot, their books are kind of based in, well, that they're based in their, in their respective like countries, but they don't really kind of translate into, I guess, well, yeah. So Zoe Washington series actually has a UK version, The Faraway Truth. While it's Mm -hmm. not actually a different language, I just found it really interesting how you have an entirely new cover and- and an entirely new title so can you share if there are any major differences in like language I guess you could say like they speak English but there's some words like there's baking involved and they say biscuits and we say cookies right yeah from so it was interesting 
Um, so when they decided to publish the book, it was interesting that they decided they didn't want to keep the title or the cover. I think it's because maybe the phrase from the desk of is not something that like is widely used in yeah. the UK. While that's a phrase, you know, people have heard of that here, you know, it's like on stationery sometimes. And um, so I don't know if that's like the main reason it just wasn't marketable for them. So they decided to change the title, which was fine. Um, and then they decided, yeah, they decided to get a new illustrator to make the cover. So I, you know, I love the way the new cover, you know, I yeah. think it's really beautiful as well. So I was happy with that. The only thing that is hard is how people often get confused and think that that is a whole other book that I wrote. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I got your all your books. Zoe Washington, The Faraway Truth, Soft Place Land. And I'm like, no, <laughs> Faraway Truth and Zoe Washington are the same book. So inside, it's exactly the same. I think they just changed the spelling of some words. Um, to make them, you know, um, UK spellings. I don't even think they changed things like from cookie to biscuit. I don't think they did that. Um, I should probably go through and look um, more carefully. But I know that they changed things like, you know, the spelling, you know, um, some of their words are spelled slightly differently. Um, but other than that, the story is exactly the same. It just causes some confusion. So I try to make it very clear on my website. This is the same book. Um, and yeah, it's just an interesting thing. I, I don't know how often it happens that they change the cover and title. Um but it did for this case. So, um, and the only other unfortunate thing is that they decided not to publish the sequel. So UK oh. readers, if they want the sequel, will have to find a way to get the um, US edition shipped to them because unfortunately this yeah. publisher decided not to go. And that's something that I guess happens sometimes. They might change their minds. Um, mm -hmm. But as of right now, um, they felt the first book worked for them and the second one did not. Um, I think a lot of times, like when it comes to foreign rights too, it's like, like their readers over there have to kind of relate to the stories as well. And so maybe like, you know, there's a lot of things in this book that are very specific to the U S you know, like the prison system, all that stuff is very specific to the U S. So yeah, in some ways it doesn't always translate. Cause it's like, that's not the way things are in the UK. So they may not understand, um, but you know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and it also got translated into two other languages. Um, oh, it got wow. translated into Turkish. Um, there's Ooh. a Turkish publisher and also into Italian, there's an Italian publisher. So that was pretty cool too. They like just, I can't read those and tell you what got changed, but it should be exactly the same in another language, just in the other languages. If I were to get my hands on an Italian copy, I'd get like an Italian to English dictionary, have it in one hand, the Zoe Washington. In I know. Hand, and just see what is, what is it? Say? And those, and those, they also kind of slightly changed the titles to make them, I think, work more, but they kept the cover. So they, they kept the same illustration from the U.S. cover, but they change the title slightly so it says like you know something else in that language that still has to do with the words so Zoe Washington is still in there but like they yeah. might have just taken out a phrase or something but so they still look like they are the same book um the UK edition is a little bit different but hopefully readers out there well I just keep reminding people it's the it's the same book don't buy that one if you're in the if you already have Zoe Washington in English in the uh, U.S. English yeah yeah that's something to keep in mind folks and I think I might still get the UK copy just to see the new cover in my hand. Yeah, I mean, it's, if you're, it's like weird to say this, but if you're a collector of Jane Marsden, <laughs> you could have it if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you have a lot of books one day, I'm going to be a Janae Marks collector. Oh, that's, Aww, gonna, that's like, amazing. I'm going to have, gonna have <laughs> podcaster, then Janae Marks books collector. Aw, that's awesome. <laughs> and my next question for you is... So you're a fan of the Babysitter's Club books, and you were as a kid, and I mean, I love the TV shows. I, I've i dabbled a bit into the books, I just haven't really read them a ton as, like, I don't know, I think I kind of just miss them, and maybe, like, I'm definitely going to get into those soon. After They have after graphic them. novels now. I think that's, like, the yeah. way that it seems like kids are reading them now is through the graphic novel versions, which is pretty yeah. cool. So my question for you is... Do you ever think back to the books that you read as a kid while writing your stories, like for kind of relatability or just style purposes? Um, yeah, I mean, not in the sense that I go back and reread the books from my childhood necessarily, although I did also really enjoy the Babysitter's Club series and was very upset when they said it was being canceled because I yeah. loved them. Um, but um, I think it's more that like I think about what I used to like reading as a kid and those books um, I loved because they were they had so many friendship stories that I could relate to. Um, I just loved like the large cast of characters. I feel like that maybe was like a nice little influence for the soft place to land in that sense. Um, and yeah, I do feel like they really did. They did still tackle some tough issues in there, you know, sometimes like sometimes the books would be about like a character going through something tough and, you know, how they all kind of get through it together. And um, so I think that just inspired me, you know, in my what I want to write now. Um, so yeah, it's not that I've necessarily gone back and reread them, but I do think that like the stories I used to love, like definitely influence the stories that I like to write about now. Um, and another way that I thought back on them, um, 
sort of is also just in the way that how I can take what I loved about them, but also change the things that now I see could be better about them. For example, um, the Babysitter's Club, the the series did a great job with this, but the actual original books were not super diverse. There wasn't a ton of diversity oh, yeah. in them. There was the one, you know, Claudia, the Asian American main character. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there was, I think, one other Black girl character that was a minor character in the books, um, but she wasn't there all the time. She wasn't necessarily prominently displayed on the cover. So I think just looking back, I can, I can say that I want to you know, I think a lot of authors are thinking this way in general now, just wanting to have more diversity in these books, um, mm-hmm. whether it's through the cast of characters or through your main character. Um, but I would say that the 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 show did a good job of kind of ch- changing that a little bit because they did change, you know, and add make yeah. some of these characters diverse that weren't actually originally those identities in the in the book. So I love that about the book about the, the series also. Um, but yeah, I think like they don't, you know, I I'll always think fondly about that series because I loved. Then as a kid, and I even wrote the author a letter when I was in like the second grade or something. I don't know. Um, and so I just remember, yeah, I was super into those books back then. And I also saw one of the characters from the Babysitters Club in a Nerd Wallet commercial, and I was like, Oh, really? Oh my goodness, it's the Babysitters Club character. I know, and that's the thing too. Like, I love how that series got a chance to expose us to some new talent. That's like people will ask me, like, Oh, who do you want to play Zoe Washington in the movie? I hope they pick somebody new like a new kid like so that like after this they can go off to do all these other cool things like that would be really cool um but yeah i think really cool the baby switch club did that for some kids too yeah and i can't wait to see well we talked about a little bit but like zoe washington on the big screen that would be so exciting and my next question for you is what is one that i ask every single author that i interview if you could be or me any literary character, fictional or real, if you could meet your favorite author or your favorite book character, who would it be and why? That is a great question. And uh, it's a kind of a tough question because there's so many really great characters yeah. out there. But in turn, I, this is a, just the first one that popped into my head. Um, but I don't know if you've read the series All Four Stars by Tara Derriman. It's a few years old now, but there were three books in the series. And it's basically about this girl named Gladys Gatsby who... Um, sort of becomes a food critic um, for a major newspaper, but the major newspaper that she's working for does not realize she's a kid because she just, everything is over email. So she's like going to these really awesome websites, um, restaurants, I mean, and <laughs> writing these amazing reviews about them and sending them into the newspaper and they're publishing them thinking that she's an adult, but she's actually a kid. It's just a really fun, adventurous story. Yeah. Um, and there's three books um, and I loved them. And I think it'd be fun to not be her, but meet her because then yeah. I could tag along to one of these amazing restaurants that she gets to um, go to because she's like a foodie and like I sometimes like to be a foodie, you know, like it's fun to go explore new restaurants and try new things. It would be fun to tag along with her on one of those food adventures that she goes on in the book where she gets to try all these cool things. Um, And yeah, I think it'd be fun to follow her around for a day. Yeah. And being a food critic sounds so much fun. Like you get to go to all these restaurants, eat, eat some amazing foods and like like when your food doesn't taste the way that you'd like it, people like the the restaurant owners and the uh work, I guess the servers, they'd actually kind of care about your opinion. Like I know they'll say, oh, my spaghetti doesn't have like enough butter on it or something like that. <laughs> they, they, yeah. So, uh, food although sometimes know. they have to be sneaky and like go in without them knowing i think it's harder if you're like a really well-known yeah. critic mm-hmm. um you know you have to kind of like go in and try not to be so obvious because then you want them to give you like their real food without knowing that you're famous yeah. but but yeah i regardless the fact that they get to go around and just try all the best food in like their area um whether it's like savory food or desserts it just sounds so cool so I would love to, uh, um, I think it would just be really fun to um, hang around with that character for a day. <laughs> um, but no, that's an awesome question. And there are so many other answers I can give. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I have not read read that th- the series before. And I already, you're making me hungry for both food and for the character. So- I know. I, it's really, it's really, it's a really fun series um, that probably deserves more attention. It's like, like I said, it's a few years old, but um, yeah. I listen to the audiobooks. I don't know if you're an audiobook person, um, but I really did enjoy listening to the art audiobook. The narrator was just really good too. So recommend that if anybody likes audiobooks. <laughs> I'm not a huge audiobook person, but I do want to dabble into them a little bit more. So, cause like there's school and like, all this other stuff going on so audiobooks kind of feel like something that I do want to try 
Yeah. Like in the car, you know, I listen um, with my daughter to audiobooks in the car when we're driving her, you know, after school to an activity, like you can listen to 15 minutes at a time, you know, but you can hear a story that way. So it's a nice way to sneak in reading when you're busy. It is. And thank you just so, so much for joining me, Janae. You have answered my questions amazingly and you've both made me hungry for both. (laughs) I kind of want to read these books all over again, just to find like have the essence and the and meet the characters once more and yeah everybody order a soft place to land on air with zoe washington from the desk of zoe washington hope wins and if you're a janae marks book collector like i am (laughs) far away truth too (laughs) yeah well thank you so much for having me it was such a pleasure to chat with you um and i loved all of your questions and so yeah thank you again um for your support and for inviting me on Well, it has been so much fun for me and everybody else. I'm sure you're all dying to read all of Janae's books. And if you aren't, you really should be. (laughs) (laughs) And I, yeah, thank you just so, so much for joining me and have a great day. All of you who, all of you readers, all of you authors, all of you, whoever you are watching this, maybe if you're a creepo, don't, don't. Don't try and find my IP address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just everybody keep reading and specifically read these books. <laughs> and yeah, see you in the next one. Bye. Bye. <laughs>